Welcome to the Poetry Mesa. My name is Catherine Marenghi, and I am speaking to you from San Miguel de Allende in Mexico. Hi, and I'm Judith Hill. Catherine and I are poets and co-founders of Poetry Mesa, a global poetry community serving poets and poetry. Mm -hmm. Welcome to our poetry table, our Mesa. And if you are here with us tonight, on time, we congratulate you um, for figuring out the complexity of two entirely different time zone systems in Mexico and US and Canada. Mexico no longer observes daylight savings time. We no longer spring forward and it has caused untold havoc in organizing and announcing events these past few weeks. So if you are here, thank you for bearing with us in a very confusing time. We're so glad you hung in and that you're here for the beginning of a very exciting tradition for us. Thankfully, we are all here. And tonight, we are proudly presenting to you the winner and the five finalists of our first annual Poetry Mesa Wild Rising Press Chapbook Contest. And every single one of these poets is an absolute delight. In our vision for Poetry Mesa, Catherine and I have always focused on giving poets a stage for their work, for their voices, their stories. So we thought it would be just a very natural thing for us to sponsor a chapbook contest and that that would be a great addition to the ways that we strive to create opportunities for poets. So we did it. And well, okay, so what is a chapbook? And I love this because I think a chapbook is a very neat thing. It is, a, it is an actually a very old word. It dates back to the 1700s. And it is a time when small books of ballads, poems, or stories were sold by itinerant peddlers. And the peddlers were called chapmen. So from that, we get the word chapbook. Nowadays, a chapbook usually means a small book that can be anywhere from 10 to 30 pages. I just love etymology, that's so fantastic. And I, ideally a poetry chapbook should have a unifying theme. It's a small book with a unifying theme. And that's one of the things we looked for when selecting the winner and finalists. Uh, we also looked for language that stirred us, images that were bold and original, and that wonderful sense of surprise that comes when a poem just grabs you in an unexpected way. And craft, that signature of skillful diligence, of the poet's patience and dedication to doing the work. And you're going to hear that tonight. Tonight, we'll hear first from our five finalists, each of whom has written a chapbook that is eminently publishable. They hail from three countries, Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. They'll each give us a little sampling of their chapbooks, and you'll see why we love their work so much. And then finally, we will hear a longer reading from our winner, whose book is going to be published by Wild Rising Press. And we're going to have the big reveal, and you'll get the first look at the stunning book cover designed by Wild Rising Press art director, Mary Mead. And just a quick reminder, don't forget to share with us your comments in the chat box below. And we'd love to hear your feedback. <clears throat> and if you have any questions about the chapbook contest or Wild Rising Press or Poetry Mesa, please share those questions in the Q&A box. Our first reader tonight is William Considine, who writes poems and plays. His books include Strange Coherence and The Furies, both from oper the operating system, The Other Myrtle from Finishing Line Press, and Continent of Fire from Kelsey Books. His full-length plays, Moral Support and Women's Mysteries, were presented in New York in 2019 to critical praise. He and his wife now divide their time between the New York City area and San Miguel de Allende, Mexico. William will be reading from his chapbook, Shedding Light. Welcome, William. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. This first poem was published in Atencion San Miguel last week. 
I am, you are. I am the morning stirring awake. You are the night still compelling with magic tales. I am a noon filled with the day's heat. You are late afternoon soothing with perfect ease. I am an evening with dark encroaching. You are skies agleam with Orion and the dog stars out of Baron and the Gemini. I am midnight fading away. You linger and stay more than a dream. This next poem is on a familiar everyday experience in San Miguel, sidestepping. Narrow sidewalks are picturesque and challenging. There's improvised etiquette with many people coming towards you on the slim and slanting sidewalks, mostly single file. Step off the roadway, ideally facing traffic or looking back with care, or with a bus roaring up from behind you, instead hug the wall and twist your arms, shoulders, packages sideways to let people pass or step up onto the threshold of a doorway and turn sideways or step down, down into the street between parked cars to pause as people walk by. We share space, calm permiso, stay alert, smile and nod, propio. Thinking also dodges, waits and yields to feelings, nods assent, shares, waits again, its turn to proceed safely toward a destination or ramble into surprises, gardens lush with new flowers, to pause with wonder, the urge welling to live in this new world, this city made long ago near the sky reflecting sheen of a spring and a stream in season surging down a gorge, water enough, a temperate place to settle. On the important subject of water, this next poem is in the words of Anna Maria, an Otomi woman. Water Report, Central Mexico. This wide, flat, bare gully was a river when I was young, thigh deep, with fish and with varied bushes beautiful beside it. When we washed our clothes in the river and laid them out to dry along the bank, Little snakes like to slide under the clothes. We took great care in picking up our clothes. That river has not flowed at all for years. Now we get our water from a spring. The government tested the water and said it's good. The aquifer is low though. Arsenic and other metals thicken. A nearby village has no spring. Now they get water from a truck. Finally, this is the title poem from my chapbook, Shedding Light. Flicker, scant, a brief light, shed light, leave it behind. What do you sense without sight? What's in your darkened mind? If you're deep, how far the gaze, worlds of tumult, how fast the focus of your days is a dear few who passed. Now let's linger on the living, their loves within our reach. Embrace the light they're giving and shine with all they teach. That's all folks. Thank you, Poetry Mesa. In our reach. Thank you, Bill. You could hear some of those really gorgeous lines in that ramble into surprises, a stream in season. And then in the title poem of the chapbook, shed light, leave it behind, what's in your darkened mind, and peer deep, how far the gaze. I really was impressed by the deaf working and reworking of the theme of light in that book. Our next reader, Gia Nold is the author of three chapbooks of poetry, including Moon is Always Moon from Green Fuse Poetic Arts. 
Gio holds a Master of Fine Arts from Naropa University and is a retired visual arts teacher from the Denver Public Schools. Her latest works have appeared in Blaze Vox, 63 Channels Magazine, Cyclamens and Swords Publishing, Blazing Stadium, Mad Blood, and Unsettled, a community art exhibition. Gia is a native of Lima, Peru, who lives here, right where I live, a homie in Evergreen, Colorado. Gia will be reading from Conversations with Sor Juana. Welcome, Gia. <clears throat> un instante me escuchen que cantar quiero, un instante que estuvo fuera del tiempo. Hear me one moment, I'm all set to sing of a moment that stood outside of time, Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz. She summons the flesh. We hear mice twinkling around you and you winter evening side by side hesitating and persuading that life is not so bad. Blind bees acting as in astronomical madness, boys struck by a dumpster at age 19, weapons, there is no escape. Cancer, are you here to kill or heal? Tigers killed, he who comes with his soul for smile, imagining a rape, where you at, assassino? Rocco Sherry Kayat, a fruit, a volcano, loves you. Hands I need, say, hands I need, beloveds. Rosa without a Rosa, not the poet of this poem, nor my resurrection. I advise herbs. They want to end global competition. They want a perfect democracy. They want a point in a distant future. This very moment, done. No one, no one comes to admire this without biting their nails. Even when I'm asleep, vibrations enter. Conversations with Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz. What is love? It's not queens and diamonds, she's daring. What is dream? It's temperature that can create love. What is motivation? It's what you're seeking. What is time? A mandate. What is beauty? A treat. At times, a half a line. What is ashes? My mind passing too soon. What is poetry? Restoration. What is body survival? Demons and monsters, some beautiful. What are gods? None of these elected lions or viracocha and story storytellers. What is life now? Nothing to prove and grave, as Dante. Will silence help? It can teach without words. Or else we don't speak about it. In loss itself, the reliefs I find. Having lost the treasure, I have nothing to fear. Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz. When I'm a com comet on fire, the crescent moon is a catastrophe with long face. It's perfectly okay to read about the cosmos blue days. Like when the planets are against each other and I get out of bed to see what gathers the horrific, what detail forms conflict. The more I look, other things happen. New killed yesterday, today, sex convict, convictions, pandemic taking more bodies. I stop the pen, look at the sky. It's crowded, protesting. The window shines sad. Music keeps my eyes closed. Laundry needs to be folded. Kindness approach, shalala, woman survives. One moment releases some more. What if I don't hear my internal self or its multiplicity of bones? See, not attached to anything. Define poetry, fun, muscle, or monk inviting inner city 
in the sensia, in imagination, indication, in perfection, in painted colors and portrait and worship, in and out of this book, iridescent in justice, in joy, in casa, mothers are in. I need the constitution of my brain on display like a fat effigy that pulls and push, sit and listen are muscles, not verbs to sing. Thank you. Gia, thank you so much for that. You know, Sor Juana de la Cru uh, Inés de la Cruz is so famous here in Mexico, um, practically unknown in the U.S., but she was probably the first woman who was published in this hemisphere, a 16th century nun, scholar, fierce feminist. And I really felt like you had summoned up her spirit in your lines. I can almost picture Sor Juana and how her mind works when I read lines like, what is love? It is not queens and diamonds. She is daring. What is dream? It's temperature that can create love. What is ashes? My mind passing too soon. And um, unfortunately, Sor Juana's life did pass much too soon. So thank you so much for summoning up the spirit in, in your work, really loved it. Our next poet, Ray Marie Taylor, is a bicultural poet originally from the American Southwest and currently living in Quebec. Ray Marie has authored and produced seven solo spoken word shows with beloved musicians and shares the stage with fellow poets on Zoom with Penn International Women Writers Committee, as well as in situ in Quebec and New Mexico. She publishes um, reviews in both cultures the Land, Our Gift, and Wild Hope Essays was a finalist for the New Mexico, Arizona Book Awards. Ray Marie will be reading from her chapbook, Steady, Against the Absurd, Kinship at the Core. Welcome, Ray Marie. Hello. So is this how the new year begins? Our hearts released in snow and freezing mountain air, beautiful rifts in the valley below, the black grace of night sky above, the Milky Way tumbling down on our horizon, sacred space, sacred place, holy land. We walk below the black brilliance. On the path among the stones, one man is not buried. We crouch around him on the parched earth, holding our hearts. Is there a spring, she asks. He does not need water now, I say. Who killed him, she wonders. The wars. Sun rumples the pink clouds over the mountain, <clears throat> glows on it before appearing. Ravens crackle, floating in the silence. We see things differently in instance of clear beauty here. There are no words, only the sheath of snow on the peak, its melt greening our path. In the daylight, we gather seeds, leaves, pollen, and sand to scatter gently on the dead brother. We sing, moan, dance, sway, rock. Softly, the water lapping somewhere below. Further on, one man is standing, alive. He is them, he is not us. He carries a weighted heart and asks for water. <clears throat> we are looking for wells, we say, come with us. As we walk, he urges, look below us. It is his village. We see the first shape of ruins, much rubble, a prison, and sheep wandering. We see the first shape of ruins. There, there is a well, she says excitedly. Where are the women? We could meet them there. We imprison them, he, he replies. 
remorseful, poets and mothers with convictions and strong voices. Eyeing him quietly, she asks, what did you do? Nothing. I stood, devastated, and watched, he grieves. I stood and watched. Oh, she moans, these times, such a betrayal, he exclaims, aghast. Yes, he confesses, chastened, shoulders hunched, head bowed, ashamed. C'est la même douleur. Together, two women and one man walk, alert, invisible, eyes opened, hearts awake, their steps laden with knowledge, weaving softly among other graves, dug high in the alpine meadows. Bird song has returned to my ears. The purest white of a fallen magnolia petal marks the path, cupped, rekindling wonder, like a seashell, open, held, sounding faraway seas, echoing voices on a disturbed path. She and I see the women walking pas à pas, one after the other, elle marche, gathering, murmuring. Is that a song they sing here at their well, greeting and watering their sheep? We wait, we see, dignity, pain, courage, love, and defiance inscribed on their faces, knowing, not having forgotten the low, white, headstones, bodies bent with visible sorrow, un qui boit, another and elder carried tenderly, their own names intact. Elles sont nous, we stand, you are us, we are each other, elles se regardent, they, we gaze into each other's eyes, we see each other, elles se reconnaissent, we greet each other, nous nous reconnaissons. A youthful woman pulls up the bucket from the well, fills the cup, offers it to one, then another, then another, one after the other. We drink water. Each fresh cup passed by hands, alive with the careful touch for hope. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. There's always such a feeling of sort of hymn or psalm in Ray's work. And I've gotten to hear her read many times. There's so many lines that I love in this. Her Ray's work gathers language like a bouquet of sound. That's one element that really moved me in her book. And then these lines, our hearts released in snow and freezing mountain air, beautiful rifts in the valley below the black brace of night sky. She writes these marvelous long lines that, that are absolutely beautifully lyrical and musical. We see things differently in instants of clear beauty here and then melt greening our path. She often will take a an adjective and use it as a verb or, or vice versa, sort of like Gerard Manley Hopkins. And I just, I love that in work. Um, and then that long stream of, of interesting language at the end of that poem, the purest white of a fallen magnolia petal marks the path, cupped rekindling wonder like a seashell held open, sounding far away seas. And the other thing I super appreciate in Ray's work is that she brings the land alive as a being. Weather and flowers and trees populate her poetry like friends. And that's just very dear to me. So it's going to be quite a gorgeous book. Our next poet, Kelly Watt, 
has published her poetry and short stories internationally and just everywhere. Her work is anthologized in Last Stanza Poetry Journal, issue number 10, and Best Canadian Stories, and in She Writes and Exile Editions, CBC2 Anthology, which was sponsored by the late Gloria Vanderbilt. Kelly has published two books, the Gothic novel, Mad Dog, published by Doubleday Canada, and Hamilton Stone Editions US, as well as her second book, the nonfiction micro book, Camino Meditations. Welcome, Kelly. Whoops, sorry, I forgot to announce the name of her, her beautiful chapbook. Kelly will read to us from the chapbook that was if it is a finalist in this contest, The Weeping Degree. Go. Hi, I'm Kelly, and I'm going to be reading a piece inspired by Four Degrees Scorpio. The chapbook is based on a series of uh, astrological signatures. And Four Degrees Scorpio, the central images, image of this signature is the following. A youth holding a lighted candle in a devotional ritual gains a sense of the great other world. From Sabian Symbols, Dane Rudyard, Astrologer. And the poem I'm going to be reading is called The Home for Little Girls to The Nightlight Knows. We sleep in a dormitory at the home for little girls in a row of tidy beds under the eaves. My bed is last, closest to the window. I can see the sandbox, metal swings, and Mrs. Mackenzie's rows of squash and beans, and beyond, the sweep of beckoning fields. At night, we say our prayers on our knees at the home for little girls. I list the names of everyone I know, counting them on my fingers, mommy and nana, grandpa and daddy, the people I see and the people I don't see ever like daddy with his cigarette pack rolled into his t-shirt sleeve and his red Corvette with the crumpled roof from when he rolled it in a ditch. His radio is always on, loud. He smells of smoke and hauls mentholated cough drops, even though he's never sick. He said he'd come back for me one Sunday, but he hasn't yet. When I'm finished pestering God about him, I list all my pets living and dead ending with Tao, the Siamese cat who plays, tag, you're it. Then I list all the other foster girls, Mindy and Darlene, the ones who are here and the ones who've disappeared, the ones whose parents got divorced, went to jail, or just stopped loving them altogether, or the lucky ones whose parents remarried or found a new babysitter. We sleep with a nightlight on at all hours at the home for little girls. When Gabby turns off the fluorescent overhead, she leaves the nightlight on to discourage crying and scare away the boogeyman, the one who hides in the house coats on the closet door or lurks among the dust bunnies under the bed. He's a trickster with many hands. He can change form at will. All night long, the night light glows, a steady beacon of yellow hope in the shape of a plastic angel with wings. She shines in the dark, guarding our sighs and dreams. One night when I can't get to sleep, I tiptoe across the floor and tell the angel my secrets in a whisper the others can't hear. Then the other girls do it too, taking turns copying me, their white nightgowns drift like cotton gross ghosts across the floor, making a shh sound. Cupping their small hands, they bend the angel's ear. Who knows what they ask for? But my wish is always the same. Only the nightlight knows. I want to go home. I want to go home. Please let me go home. Thank you.
Excuse me. Kelly, thank you so much for, for this wonderful book. It, it really, really left a mark on me the way it just shifts so um, seamlessly between dream and reality and childhood memory. And it all just sort of blends together. You're not sure if it's a dream or if it's real. Um, the, some of the passage you just read was, uh, was something that I had flagged when I was reading it as a very special set of lines. When I can't go to sleep, I tiptoe across the floor and tell the angel my secrets. Um, and they all the other little girls, too, are taking turns and copying me, their little white nightgowns drifting like cotton coasts. Cupping their small hands, they beg the angel's ear. Who knows what they ask for? My wish is always the same. Only the nightlight knows I want to go home. It's a, a really heartbreaking and wonderful book. So thank you so much, Kelly, for sharing that with us. I'd like to introduce our next reader, Julianza Shaven, relocated from Georgia to the foothills of the Rocky Mountains in 1993. A dedicated synesthete, insomniac, and chocoholic who has been called a poet of place. She recently completed a master's degree in creative writing with a thesis comprised of 60 video poems. Past president of Poetry, Re Poetry West Colorado Springs, she is assistant editor, proofreader, and production consultant for Future Cycle Press in Athens, Georgia. Three dogs, two cats, and one partner in Grime are her local staff. We will hear a reading from her chapbook, Silence Dreams as well. Welcome, Julianza. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to dedicate this reading to Hank Bukema. Another skin, or Colorado springtime. The unseen lion thrashes all backs, sides, fronts, crashes you into yourself in ways worse than the brute muscling that pulses you to first stark light. You take as shelter a lone tree, a stoic survivor of bleakness, sensing both wonder and terror in such strange naked orphanage. Your limbs torso comforting like a marionette in slapstick. Oh, you must hug that tree's simple spine. The dust rips about everywhere. Mad prairie wind devouring all purses when of a sudden confounded, something in you embraces the terrible tableau and you find yourself at home at last if not in your own skin, in the lands. My little countryside of Fountain, Colorado. So far we see no traffic jams, no bustle or road rage, but yesterday, notice due north a mile, huge piles of dirt swaggering under a blameless sun, excavators, graders, bulldozers, backhoes, and other things we could never name all for profit off subdivisions to come, off sumptuous shag of purple alfalfa singing in wind, theft of the land's identity, Hamazot's houses cannibalizing green fields, machines tearing memories from trees. What is beyond condemnation by man? It is late, late, so early in our history. Here we hope for paradise now, something creatureless, virtueless, some penitent dark salvation for this near widowed world. <clears throat> Pantomime. When Amory retrieved his horses, it was a gray day, a vacant day, a day of Scant weather, drizzle blurred the cataract north window. Amory was not actually there. He had sent the 20 something girls whose bodies were lithe, free, and insouciant. They joked and punched, stumbled and righted. Unremarkable pantomime. Hundreds of feet down the dirt drive, 
The horses were statues tethered to a post. I walked my oldness partly down to where the trailer would be. I had named them the white siblings, sonnet and prose, the giant who was brown, Leon, after a deceased friend, Leon. They had eaten from my hand and one day marked me forever with a brutal kick, jostling near the trough. Sudden pain there in the unctuous sun, a few days residual limp, a deformed thigh, a memento. Fastened by their halters now, the horses were again anonymous beings, humbled in the trailer, arrived to a scuffle, one of them, and then all were gone. I could not bear to go out the next day, but the day after, faced the blank fields head on with the dogs, a trek with no dire consequences of overloving. From the easternmost field, the house became so small, the sky a sorrow of cloud, water had evaporated from the trough, brown and dreaming, the opaque remainder was graced by a tumbleweed. I had chosen silence as my final home and the silence dreamed as well. And finally, chiaroscuro for Jerry Fields. Out the west picture window, castle on castle, of blue mountains. If you travel towards them, they grow larger or seem to in their lovely, in their ardor for us, for sky. But this day, I travel east with my lover. Out the back window, as in the rear view mirror, the peaks diminish, then flatline like a dying patient's monitor. The green gold plains, mighty arms spread, journey us, hug us through with their humble scrub and cilia. The sky before us, enormous, empty, and singing. Thank you. Thank you, Julianza. Your work is always so strong. Um, one thing, Catherine and I were really struck by the integrity of Julianza's voice and her subject. There's a powerful unifying theme in this book, vivid, fierce poems, grieving and honoring earth life, but from a very, very personal place. And of course, she has amazing images in lines such as the brute muscling that pulsed you to first stark light. And then I think we just heard that one sumptuous shag of purple alfalfa singing in wind. And this one, the sky, a sorrow of cloud. And then of course, these lines, I had chosen silence as my final home and the silence dreamed as well. Yeah, this was a really a wonderful read, this book. So thank you. Thank you to all our finalists. And thank you to everyone who sent a manuscript into us for this, our first annual Wild Rising Press Poetry Mesa Chapbook Contest. We look forward to reading lots more next year. And now, Catherine and I are proud and excited to introduce the winner of our chapbook contest, Amy Ray Irish. Amy Ray Irish grew up near Chicago, received her MFA from the University of Notre Dame, then fled the Midwest for Colorado sunshine. She has recently been published online at 20 Bellows Lit and South Broadway Ghost Society. 
She's also published in the anthologies We Are the West and Curious Curo, and in the national journal Stone Gathering. Her 2020 chapbook, Breathing Fire, received the Fledge Award from Middle Creek Publishing. And Amy's winning chapbook, Down to the Bone, skillfully draws upon inspiration from fairy tale, myth, and legend. Down to the Bone is stunning in its visceral imagery, powerhouse energy, and startling insights into the felt experience of being a woman in both real and imagined worlds. In language that is both haunting and profound, Amy asks her midnight question, who, who will join me in this ritual of sacred meat? Who, who will study our future by the bones within? This is wise and deftly, subtly, elegantly, subversive collection. Amy's taut, vivid, vivid images and her crafted language make for bold, starkly original poems that bring ancient understandings and current conditions into alert, vivid collision. And now we're gonna bring you a good long look at the exquisite book cover of Amy's book, designed, as I told you, by Wild Rising Press's art director, Mary Mead. And Catherine and I want to mention that, as always, we'll follow up tonight's presentation with an email to everyone who has registered for this event, and you will receive a link to pre-order Amy's book from Wild Rising Press. And I promise you, you do want to order this book down to the bone. We're also going to be sending everyone a handout with more information about all our poets, and you'll get a link to the recording of this program for those who weren't able to see it live. So here it is, let's look at it again. Amy's beautiful book cover. <laughs> there it is. And this is really the beginning because this design is going to be carried forward with slight changes in our future chapbook winners in the coming years. And now I am so pleased to present our winning poet. This book is so, it, the consonants of the poetry, the voice, it's so strong. And the images are absolutely piercing and gorgeous. Here is our winning poet, Amy Ray Irish. Welcome, Amy. Thank you, and I am so honored. Let's start with the poem that Catherine just mentioned, The Secret Knowledge of the Earth. The girl burned her eyes to black searching in books, in fairy tale worlds, but when the moon quickened in the belly of the forest, her senses blossomed, eyes unblinded to the subtleties of night. And then it was all dark knowledge, body knowledge, instinct, hunger, need, desire, silent unfurling of wings to hunt a single beating heart, talons deep in oak, deep in flesh, unsettling sleepers with her call, her haunting midnight question, who, who will join me in this ritual of sacred meat? Who, who will study our future by the bones within? I've been asked, what does my title mean to me? In its most common definition, down to the bone means getting right to the deepest, most essential part. It is very emotional, but also very physical. We say we are soaked to the bone, we're shocked to the bone. So this book gets down to the bone by stripping away some of the modern masks that we are forced to put on and get, getting back to the core of our strength. Like the bones that we can't see, the truth about us exists inside us, but needs to be revealed. Like in that last poem, the bones within are a kind of divination of the self. 
Another poem in my book that features the power of bones is called Casting a Bone Broth Spell. This is from a real life experience. I grew up with no larger circle of women or ancestral women's traditions. My mother was never taught to make bone broth, so she couldn't teach me. It was only when living in Colorado and being very sick as an adult that I had a circle of friends who taught me. And what I learned really reframed a lot of fairy tales for me. I saw a real witchcraft in it, as you'll see in my poem, Casting a Bone Broth Spell. The elders are surprised at my ignorance of how to brew the potion they drink to conjure life from death. They're taken aback at the way my hands balk at pulling apart the carcass to strip skeleton out of flesh. They're stunned by my mouth and tongue turned aside at the taste of three day soup, which has steamed kitchens for generations. The motherless child in stories is still encircled by women, rooted or good or ill in stepmother, widow and witch. Each added something to the recipe, offered the girl's cook pot of self a necessary ingredient to season the stew. But then the editors stepped in, slapped down that slippery, many-faced mother, decreed only the wicked could cook up a cauldron of bone. I'll grind your bones to make my bread, proclaims the giantess. I'll roast your meat and drink the dripping juices, promises Baba Yaga. How poetic she is, this dark shaft inside me, this hungry self split and hidden in shadow. How she smells out the savory bits others deny. On cold days, I now know how to build the fire that simmers and pulls the marrow from the earth. Offered her bloody breast, I've learned to drink. Now let's talk a little about Adam and Eve. As a child, the first thing I wondered about the temptation story was not about sin or the garden or God, but how did the serpent talk to Eve? And see, I was obsessed with words even then. So I've noticed that humans always project a human voice onto the serpent. But I try to imagine how snakes actually communicate, perhaps with their movements and their bodies. Maybe they are still trying to communicate with us. Maybe learning serpent's language used to be passed down mother to daughter and we have lost that ability. If so, maybe we have the temptation story all wrong. <clears throat> so I retell that encounter in my poem, Speaking Serpent. When I approach the shadows, she pauses her slim slate form, doubles back and flickers the black fork of her tongue to double check if it's safe to talk. She cannot speak, of course, but even in silence communicates much with the coil and calligraphy of her body. With mine, I move in supplication, dance the words to my dangerous ask. In response, she swims through the grass, asking where and when with every curve scales a shimmer of her Morse code message. My hands flutter the message here and now. At this, she stiffens, darts swift as an arrow, points the way to escape Eden and is forever branded a dark serpent of questionable intent rather than one sister showing another how to shed her useless skin.
My husband is a storyteller in the tradition of Robert Bly and Clarissa Pincola Estes, using fairy tales and mythologies as ways to go inward to learn about the psyche. When I met my husband, this was a new idea to me that I could be any character in a fairy tale. Well, perhaps I was all of them, the men, the women, the villains, even the magical creatures. And the journey or danger or rescue that takes place in these stories can all be metaphorical and inside us. Our current culture is obsessed with action heroes who single-handedly save the world. But is that who we are, who we want to be, who the world needs us to be? I explore that in my poem, Rewriting the Mythology. We all begin the same, saints and sorcerers and monster slayers, all of the saviors seen on every page, spun again and again in narratives of the daring, fables of the fair. But eventually, real life complexities crack us open. Our chronicles of self are broken at the spine, and we turn to a different story, a different shelf. Perhaps because we can't stand the senseless sweat of sewing nettles, Turns out it's all sacrifice and silence. Perhaps because we'd rather wildly cry, become a brother swan. Perhaps because our hearts hurt not for Beanstalk Jack, but for the harp, sick of playing on demand. Perhaps because we're disinclined to wonder about the getting of wishes and more interested in getting the fair folk in bed. Perhaps because we've seen all those former heroes on the street, their slack faces empty of meaning. They're waiting now, nameless grains of sand sleeping on the beach of the masses, waiting to be called to story, to become. And we are the few who refuse to huddle on the endless rocky shore, waiting through book after book until some Thor calls up a lightning bolt to shock us awake and make us act? Perhaps because we are the few who dare to rise up in a sandstorm whirl and harness the electric power of creation ourselves, wielding the written lightning to strike the beach and forge the melting sand to glass and start a mythology all our own. My book also includes transformations, spring rebirths, and rewriting stories to feature our own voices. These poems from beginning to end are an invitation to strip down something in your life and then give birth to yourself again. So I will read one more poem, a poem of rebirth titled, Let Us Begin. As spring cracks open, all downy and wet with eyes squinted into the dawn, let us begin to be new ourselves, all body slick and wonderment. Let us begin with that first hypnotism of sky that first delight of description in our mouths, that first color of spring so verdant that its vibrance escapes every word's confinement and is only expressed by our breath opening as we sing this throat pulsing, succulent noted song. Let us begin a new calendar filled only with new days, every day the equinox, every day a seeds crackling earthquake birth. Let us begin despite those who drag us back, making plans and demands, despite those who upend the earth, who deny and try to forget the trees making love all around us. Let us begin to reconcile with the earth. Let us begin to believe we can. Let us begin to remember that we are the process too 
part of the endless shattering of snow cover, driven apart by the piercing crest of the infant white crocus as it crowns. Yes, let us begin like the earth, always a new bloom bursting at the starting line, aching to open and let sun in. Thank you so much. Wow, gorgeous. Thank you poetry. so much. That was a really beautiful reading, Amy. Thank you. We're so proud of you. And congratulations for this really beautiful piece of work. It was really a pleasure to read it. And now we'd like to bring out all our poets one more time so we can give everyone a huge applause, both for their work and for what it takes to put together a manuscript and send it into a contest. This isn't a little thing. And Catherine and I know this because we live this life too. So we really want to congratulate all of you for the work you've put in. It's there, it's on the page. Thank you so much. Come back everybody so we can applaud for you, please. Mm -hmm. Lucky you. Are we all here? We're all here. Where's William? William. William. Thank you for your terrific readings. Thank you. Brilliant. What a really extraordinary group so of poets Thank here. You so much. <laughs> Thank you. The, the host has. Uh, Namaste to everybody. Anyway. There he so is. Hi, William. Hi. <laughs> I'm glad to see you all. Um, thank you all again. Um, we want to give some special thanks to the San Miguel Literary Sala for hosting our event, and in particular, our production team, Tina Bika and Patty Garcia, who make this event possible. Our deepest gratitude also to you, our audience, who complete the circle of this international poetry community. And don't forget to look out for our follow-up email uh, with information on how to order Amy's new book. You will want to order this book. I know I will. And I hope you will um, look to our website and join our mailing list to get information on this and other future readings. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us all tonight. Thank you so much. And we are thinking that our next event is going to be all about poetry slam and and actually we are we have some very very big guests that we are hoping to line up to bring you such an exciting look at that movement in poetry so thank you all thank you amy thank you our beloved finalists and good night <laughs> all right thank you